All right, we'll begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa awtalu salati wa tamat taslim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. All right, after a week layoff, we have uh, resuming back our class on the uh, <coughs> introduction to fiqh, basic introduction to fiqh. So we have uh, previously covered uh, definition, what is the linguistic definition of fiqh, uh, technical definition. We went over the connection uh, that there is between fiqh and aqidah. Uh, we also compared uh, man-made legislation to divine legislation and uh, we also went over the last thing we did was the main sources of Islamic law. All right, before we begin today's session, um, is everybody part of the WhatsApp group? If you're not part of the WhatsApp group, scan the, the, uh, the, the bar code, uh, the QR code. You can scan the QR code. You can come up and uh, take a picture of it, inshallah, if you can get it from there. You just need to scan it with your phone. Oh, okay. okay. So you can join the group. You're, I think you're part, you're part of the group already. The WhatsApp group. Oh, the WhatsApp group? Yeah, the, the, the same WhatsApp group. All right. <clears throat> because we're going to begin with a quiz. All right? We're going to begin with a quiz. So in order for you to access that quiz, you need to uh, be part of the WhatsApp group. So if you're not part of the WhatsApp group, scan the, the QR code and then... Uh, you should have access to join. No, no. So, All right, everybody part of the group? Yeah, um, I see you, you should be, you should have been joined by now. All right, so I'm gonna put the, 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 the link for the quiz in the group. All right, the quiz, link for the quiz is gonna be in the, in the WhatsApp group. All right, so, Click on the link in the WhatsApp group. Uh, once everybody's ready, we'll begin, inshallah. All right, are we all ready? Anybody else who's trying to get in can't get in? Okay. All right, so let's begin as we're waiting for the, the um, <clears throat> setup on the, on the, the screen. All right, so... We'll begin, inshallah. All right, so this is a time quiz, right? You have 20 seconds to answer. So make sure you answer within the time limit. Uh, if you don't, if the, qu the quicker you answer, the, the higher your score. Those who are not here before, you know, you try your best to guess the answers. Um, but it is based on what we have covered in the, in the previous two classes. All right, we'll begin, inshallah. So you can look at your device uh, for the questions. All right, starting now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Let's let's go over the questions then. Inshallah. All right. Uh, what is the linguistic definition of fiqh? Linguistic understanding. All right. Fiqh linguistically means understanding, and then it has an acquired technical definition, uh, which we mention after that. All right. Uh, the hadith. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Indeed, uh, is this correct, true or false? The, indeed, the shortness of a man's prayer and the lengthening of his speech is a sign of his fiqh. True or false? False. What is the correct answer? The other way around, right? The lengthening of a man's prayer and the shortening of his speech is a sign of his fiqh. This, the word fiqh here is being used in a linguistic sense, meaning sign of his understanding. All right, uh, three, fiqh is the knowledge of the rules of the revealed law that are attached to the beliefs of those legally responsible. True or false? Okay, it's false. Why is it false? Not that part. 
But you got it right, right? All right, but <laughs> why is it why is it wrong? All right, look at the part where it says attach the beliefs. No, not the legally responsible. It is uh, it's for low the legal responsible. Look at the part where it says attach the beliefs. Is fiqh attach the beliefs? It's attach the actions. All right, beliefs are your aqidah. There, of course, there's a connection between the two, right? But fiqh is about your actions, right? Knowledge of the, re the rulings of the revealed law that are attached to the actions of those legally responsible. Number four, salat al-wajib is wajib, mandatory according to which legal school? Hanafi school. Let's get the hands off of the Hanafis here. Any other Hanafis? Okay. <laughs> All right. And number five, rulings that are connected to the actions of people and their transactions with one another are called? Mu'amalat. All right, this is a category of fiqh. If you open a book of fiqh, they're going to start with ibadat, and then uh, depending on the order. It's always going to start with the ibadat, but then it might go into different <coughs> uh, categories, but one of them is going to be mu'amalat, transactions, all right, buying and selling, trade. All right, this is called mu'amalat. Rulings that are connected to punishment of criminals and maintaining security and order are called uqubat, right, the punishment for theft, the punishment for murder, the punishment for drinking alcohol. All right, these are called uqubat. All right, the rulings of the real law found in the books of fiqh are divided into how many categories? This one is, I think, a bit tricky. How much? Seven. seven. All right, can we get seven categories? So we already have two. Ibadat, worship. All right, what else? Yes. Which was, anybody remember the Arabic term for that? It's called sirr, right? Sirr. All right, so you have ibadat, worship, <coughs> mu'amalat, transactions, dealings with people. Family. Family, ahwal shakhsiya. Right, that's three. Uh, what he just said, between the nations, that's four. The rulers, ahkam al-sultaniya, the, the, specifically the rule, that's five. Uqubat, six. And there's one more. Akhlaq, seven. All right, so the books of fiqh are divided into these main categories. With the presence of concessions, all Islamic rulings are within the capability of a person to, a per, a person to perform. True, right? Because as we said, the, the Sharia, the, the Islamic legal uh, rulings are based upon ease, meaning that there is everything is within your capability. Allah has not placed any difficulty uh, in the religion. And if you're not able to perform a certain action, then it is either reduced or dropped, right? And we gave the example of a person not able to stand, they can pray sitting. If you're not able to sit, you can pray lying down or on your side and so on. So with the presence of concessions, every single Islamic ruling is within the capability of a person to perform. Uh, number nine, there are how many sources of, main sources of Islamic fiqh? Four, which are? Quran, Sunnah, Ijma' and Qiyas. Quran, Sunnah, Ijma', consensus, Qiyas, analogy. And uh, number 10, which of the following in the Quran? They're all found. All right, they're all found in the Quran. Permissibility of trade. Allah has uh, allowed trade. Obligation of hijab. And another verse as well on that. Prohibition of alcohol. Right, also in the Quran. Uh, all these are found in the Quran. Which of the following rulings is found only in the Sunnah? Gold, right? Fa fasting is in Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ladina amanu, kutiba alikum siyam. Prohibition of gambling. Inna al khamru wal maysir wal insab wal insalamu, rijusu min amil shaytan. Obligation of divorced women to wait three periods. Also in the Quran. Yatarabbasna bi anfusihinna thalatha tukuru. They have to wait three periods. Uh, prohibition of gold. This is only in the Sunnah. All right. Uh, who... Who, who won the quiz, by the way? Is there any leaderboard or anything? Okay, who, who's number one? Who wants to claim the top prize? You? Okay. Who's number two? Okay. <clears throat> who's number three? Number seven, yes. No, the, the, the format kind of changed it, but I have to go look at it. The, the way we did it before was a bit different. We have to go back to that format. 
Yeah, yeah. There's something changed in, in, in the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these, yeah, they're divided into categories. These rulings are divided into categories. Oh, okay, okay. I, yeah, I see what you're saying. Maybe we could have worded it a bit better. Um, oh, yeah, the lead word is here. Okay. All right, so number one is fizz. That you said, okay. Number two, who's sushi? Okay. Okay, looks like you bumped down to three. Tariq, four. Mukti has a nine, five. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, well, next, next, next time, inshallah, we'll try to go back to the original format, I think, which was a bit better. Because this is more of a self pace, I think. Okay. All right, we'll begin, inshallah, uh, today's session. All right, so the last thing we stopped at was the main sources of Islamic law. So we said that there are four. Quran, Sunnah, Ijma' and Qiyas. Ijma' is the consensus. All right, consensus. Consensus of who, though? Okay, good. All right, that's a very important point. And not all scholars. Not all scholars. So, for example, a scholar of Aqidah is not considered an Ijma'. Right? Or a hadith scholar. It's not considered necessarily. He, he could be, but what we're specifically speaking about are scholars who have reached a certain rank, call a mujtahid. Right? Scholars who reach this rank, this is a mujtahid is a person who is qualified to extract rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah. Right? If you have reached the level of ijtihad, you are qualified to extract rulings. So this person can determine that this is haram, this is halal, of course, with evidence. Right? They're not making it up. But once you have reached this qualification, then this is called a mujtahid. And amongst these are the four imams, right, and others who came after them. It is these people who their uh, agreement is considered a source of Islamic law. So if all of the mujtahid scholars of a particular era, they agree on something, then this becomes Islamic law, right? So if all the scholars, the mujtahid scholars of a particular era, they agree that this thing this particular ruling is that it is obligatory. Then it becomes obligatory. Uh, yeah. So it's the same. So the the question is about what are the qualifications? Uh, there's a long. There's a list. Um, we'll get to that a bit later on, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> but it's the same qualifications that have always existed, right? Or more or less. More or less. Some things might have been added. Uh, as the time has gone on, uh, because you need to know what the scholars differed on. All right? That's one of the, uh, one of the uh, requirements. So if you don't know, if you haven't you know, let, uh, read what has, the previous scholars have wrote, then you won't know what they agreed on, what they disagreed on, uh, and so you won't be qualified. All right? That's one example of it. But inshallah, that, that will, uh, something will come on later. All right, so for example, there is, uh, during the time of the Prophet Wasallam. Uh, or after, after the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the companions, right? The companions, they came to a consensus about the inheritance of the grandfather, all right? So the grandfather, if a person dies and they have a son, but their father is no longer alive, but the grandfather is alive, does the grandfather inherit from that person? And if he does, what share does he get? All right, so this is not in the Qur'an, right? The, the Qur'an does not mention anything about the grandfather. It's not in the sunnah either about the grandfather, specifically the grandfather, this ruling. So the Sahaba got together and they came to an agreement. Now this agreement that they're coming, uh, agreeing to, they're not making it up. It's, it's based on other evidences as well, right? Uh, it could be based on an analogy, right? Making analogy to the father, saying that the, if, if the father was here, what would the father get? And so the grandfather gets that, right? So, but they, the Sahaba, they came together and they came to agreement that if a person dies, they have a son, there's no father, but they have a grandfather, that the grandfather inherits a sixth, one sixth of the estate. 
right? So this now becomes law, Islamic law. Because the Sahaba, and what we mean by the Sahaba are the scholars amongst the Sahaba, right? Because not all the, the Sahaba were scholars. Some of them were very simple people. Some of them were just farmers, Bedouins. They're all considered Sahaba, but not all of them were uh, scholars. So we're, we're specifically speaking about the scholars, the knowledgeable amongst the Sahaba. They came to agreement that the deceased person who dies and he leaves behind his son, no father, but there's a grandfather, the grandfather would inherit one sixth, right? So this is an example of ijma'ah, consensus. All right, what is the proof that this is a source of Islamic law? There are uh, proofs and evidences in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Amongst them is uh, the hadith in which Rasulullah says, I ask Allah not to let my ummah gather upon error, and he granted me that. Right? I ask Allah not to let my ummah gather upon error, and he granted me that. All right, uh, and another hadith of Rasulullah says, لا تجتمع, لا تجتمع على My ummah will never gather upon misguidance. So it's not possible that all of the ummah would gather upon an error. So if they gather upon something, then this is an indication that this thing is correct and becomes a source of Islamic law. All right, and there's some verses of the Quran as well. وَمَن يُشَاقِخِ الرَّسُولَ وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Whoever disobeys the messenger and they follow a path other than the path of the believers. This is all right, amongst the proofs that are used for consensus. So if all the Muslims uh, meaning, now when we say all the Muslims, we're specifically talking about a specific group of the Muslims, right? Because uh, a, random, a random Muslim who knows nothing, it wouldn't make sense for them to be included in a, uh, in a discussion where they have no knowledge, right? So we say consensus the Muslims, but we're really speaking about a certain group of the Muslims who are specialized in, in whatever field that we're, that we're discussing. All right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Clear. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, this seems to be that the companions are legislating, right? When we already said that only Allah and his messenger can legislate. So is this not legislation? So we say that from the conditions of ijma' is that they have to have a proof and evidence, right? If they were speaking without proof or evidence, then this would be legislation. But ijma' has to have a, uh, what they call a mustanad. It has to go back to something in the Quran and Sunnah. So in this case, it would be like an analogy. They go, they're going back to the Quran and Sunnah and they're making an analogy between the father and the grandfather. So they are still going back to the Quran and Sunnah. They are still following evidence, right? Uh, so they're not legislating. Uh, and this is similar to you know, uh, a scholar saying, witter is Sunnah, right? Uh, Rasulullah did not clarify the ruling, but that scholar extracted that ruling from the Quran and Sunnah. He's not legislating, right? He's extracting the ruling, right? So when the scholars come to a consensus, they're not making up a ruling. They're looking at the Quran and Sunnah, and then they are agreeing upon this evidence to give this ruling, right? So it's not legislation. It's not uh, considered legislation uh, independently. Allahu All right, so this is consensus. This is the third source of Islamic law. Uh, it comes after the Quran and it comes after the Sunnah. Yes. So, consensus happens based off of scholars. Yes. Agree to something at a particular point in time. So, the question is consensus happens when scholars agree on something in a particular time. Yes. Right. So, then what happens if the conditions change? Like, um, you know, so 500 years ago they said that something was this. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we know differently now. And, you know, at what point does that consensus become sort of non binding? Okay. And because of changing times and circumstances and knowledge of things in general. Right. So, num so the question is what happens if they agreed, the scholars agreed to something, they came to some consensus like 500 years ago on something, and then the times have changed? Can that ruling change? The answer is no. 
right? Consensus is binding, it cannot be changed, it cannot be lifted. Because this would go against the, the whole concept of ijma, which is that the ummah cannot unite upon error. Right? But remember that what they are agreeing on are fiqh issues. Right? Fiqh issues. And they're not going to agree on something unless there's something strong to support it. Right? But once they've come to agreement, and this is also part of the rules of consensus, is that no one is allowed to go against the ijma. However, uh, we need to be careful because there's sometimes claims of ijma are made. And when you go and you look, then uh, you might see that it's not really uh, ijma. There wasn't really ijma. Maybe there was one scholar who dissented. Or maybe there's one scholar who did not agree, but we don't know. All right? So from that angle, we can say that maybe there was not really a consensus on this issue. But if the consensus is established, then it becomes binding. It becomes binding and it cannot be reversed. Right? Mm-hmm. Would you say those are two main sources in the rest? It's so minor. I mean, he asked, I mean, Quran is so minor. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's Quran and Sunnah. Like, one could, you know, one could say two main sources of Quran and Sunnah. All right, so the question is can we say the Quran and Sunnah are the two main sources and everything else is secondary? Yeah, yeah that, that is the case. The Quran and Sunnah are the main sources. And the Ijma and the Qiyas and all the other sources, they come after in rank. So definitely the Quran and Sunnah are the main sources. But sometimes the, the Quran and Sunnah, there are rulings in there, uh, or there are situations that arise where there's no ruling mentioned. And we'll get to that when we talk about Qiyas. What do we do then? We need to have uh, another source, right? Or we need to be able to still extract a ruling even if there is nothing explicitly mentioned uh, in the Quran and Sunnah. Like, like this example we gave here, right? About the grandfather. Right? The Quran does not mention about the grandfather. Right? The, the Sunnah does not mention about the grandfather. Can we be left without a ruling? We need to have a ruling. Right? We cannot just say there's no ruling on the matter. There must be a ruling. The grandfather is either we say he inherits or he doesn't inherit. If he inherits, then he has to have inherit a certain amount. So we need a ruling. If it's not there in the Quran or the Sunnah, then we go to the other sources. Right? The ijma. We see is there an ijma on this matter? And we find that there is an ijma. The, the Sahaba, they gathered together and they agreed that uh, the, the grandfather will inherit, and he will inherit one sixth. All right. Um, all right. Moving on to analogy. All right. Analogy in Arabic is called qiyas, al qiyas, right, and this means when we join a matter for which there is no ruling in the revealed law to a matter for which there is a ruling, due to a shared illa. This word illa, we can translate it as the effective cause, the effective cause between them. All right. So we have a. Um, foundational issue, right? You have a foundational issue, such as the ruling on wine. This is a foundational issue. And then we have a branch issue. So the foundational issue is present in the Quran and the Sunnah. An issue in the, in the case of wine, wine is prohibited by the text of the Quran, right? Uh, Allah uh, prohibits alcohol in the Quran. Uh, the verse on, what was the verse in the Quran? No. Uh, Right? The, the gambling and the, the, the altars and so on. So it is pro- uh, prohibited by the text of the Quran. Right? Wine. And the wine is a specific type of alcohol that comes from the grapes. All right, now what about something like whiskey? Right? Or vodka or whatever, I don't know, whatever alcoholic drinks they have today. All right? We don't find these names in the Quran or in the Sunnah. All right? um, but there is a shared illa, there is a shared uh, effective cause that will join these two together and then will give them the same ruling. And that effective cause is that they both intoxicate. Right? They both intoxicate. So because they both intoxicate, the branch issue will take the ruling, the same ruling as the foundational issue. So the foundational issue is that wine is prohibited. The branch issue is, let's say, vodka. Vodka and wine both intoxicate, so therefore, vodka is haram because it has the same shared reason, effective cause. Right? So this is what we call analogy. This is what we call qiyas or analogy. And there are four pillars of analogy. The first is the foundational issue, right? which is, in the example we gave, wine. All right, the second is the branch issue. Uh, the second is the branch issue. 
all right, which is vodka. All right, the third is the foundational issues ruling, which is the ruling on wine, which is prohibition. And the fourth pillar of analogy is the illa, which is the effective cause that joins the two together. All right, so once we have those four, then it's going to produce a result, which is that vodka is haram because it intoxicates just like wine intoxicates. All right, and they have the example given here. All right, another example is uh, Rasulullah says in hadith, لا يقضي القاضي وهو غضبان Right, the, the qadi, who's the qadi? Anybody know? The judge, right? So Rasulullah says that the judge is not allowed to rule when he is angry. When he is angry. All right? Why is that? Because he might give a ruling based on emotion. He's angry, he's upset, he had a bad day. And somebody comes to him and he says, you're wrong. And he, and he issues a ruling out of emotion. So Rasulullah says that لا يقضي القاضي وهو غضبان the, the Qadi should not rule, give any ruling when he's angry. So what is the, so now we, the scholars, what they'll do is they will extract the illa, they extract the effective cause that made this person, uh, made the ruling, the original ruling, which is he's angry. Uh, but what is the reasoning behind the anger is that it messes a person's concentration or it messes a person's ability to give a fair ruling. All right, so... We give, so they take from this, so, so we have the foundational issue, which is that you cannot give a ruling or you cannot judge when you are hungry. So that's the foundational issue. And the ruling it is prohibition. All right, now we have the branch issue, which is what if you are extremely hungry? The Qadi is extremely hungry. So we will do Qiyas. We will see that there, is, there a, uh, is there a connection between the two, which is we look for, do they share the same effective cause of the illa? The illa is that anything that distracts you from being able to judge properly, then you're not allowed to judge in that situation. So anger is the original ruling. The branch ruling is hunger. They're joined together by the fact that both of them distract the judge from being able to judge fairly and partially. So we will do what we call analogy or qiyas, and we will say that the judge is not allowed to judge when he's angry, and likewise, the judge is not allowed to judge when he is hungry, or extremely hungry, or he's extremely thirsty. Some of them even say if he's extremely happy. Right? Anything that shares that, what they call the illa, the effective cause, anything that's going to distract that judge from giving a fair and partial ruling, then this would fall under prohibition, not by the text, but by analogy. All right, clear? Yes, right, so somebody kidnaps the judge's wife. Is he, is he able to think um, clearly, right? Is he, is he able to concentrate on the issue, all right? This will distract him. So this will be another uh, cause that would, you know, we would say the judge is not allowed to judge in that situation, all right? So there are a number of examples, right? Um, these are two that, we, uh, that, are, that are there. All right, so this is the fourth source of Islamic law, which is what we call al-qiyas or analogy, yeah. Yeah, so illa, this is what we call the effective cause. This is the reason behind the ruling. The reason behind the ruling. All right, so why is alcohol prohibited? Because it causes intoxic intoxication. All right, why, the, why is the judge not allowed to judge when he's angry? Because it distracts him from being able to judge fairly. All right, so this is the reason behind the ruling. All right, the reason behind the ruling. So if we have a uh, a foundational issue and have a branch issue, we need to make sure that they, sh they share the same reason for the ruling. If, the, if, the, if, the, if the, the reason is not the same, then they cannot share the same ruling, right? Because they have to share the same reason for them to have the same ruling. All right, so this, that's uh, Al Qiyas. All right, so uh, after covering the, the main sources of Islamic legislation, uh, we move on to the necessity of adhering to Islamic fiqh and its rulings. And evidences for such in the Quran. So this is very simple, which is that these rulings, right, that, uh, that, are the, the, that the scholars derive, right, something is wajib, something is uh, recommended, right, something is haram, 
these rulings need to be adhered to because they come from the they're derived from the Quran and Sunnah and its secondary sources. So they take the same status as the Quran and Sunnah, right? So all the rulings of Islamic fiqh, we have to uh, we're obligated to follow them. Right? We're obligated to follow them just like we're obligated to follow the Quran and Sunnah, right? So we're obligated to follow the rulings that are extracted from the Quran and Sunnah, just like we're obligated to follow the Quran and Sunnah. All right, so if we were to say that we can just, uh, the scholars say that this particular, uh, this particular issue, this thing is haram, all right? If it was a choice now where we can just say, you know, I don't, I don't want to follow that, then this is effectively not following the Quran and Sunnah, all right? Because these rulings take the same status as the Quran and Sunnah. All right, so some basic evidences. Allah Azza wa says the Quran, اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه أولياء. Follow what has been sent down to you from your Lord, and do not follow protectors apart from Him. So this and here is uh, extra. All right, so follow what has been sent down to you from your Lord. So follow the Quran, and this also means follow the rulings that we extract from the Quran. All right, follow the Quran meaning follow the rulings that are extracted from the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, وأقيم الصلاة. So we derive from that, salah is obligatory. So now this is, this is a ruling that we have to follow based on this verse. Right? This is follow what has been sent down. The ruling extracted from that verse is that it is obligatory to pray. Right? Allah says in the Quran, illa Do not kill a soul uh, that Allah has not allowed you to kill except with due right. So we extract from that the ruling that it is haram to murder. Right? It's haram to kill. So haram to kill somebody, right? So this is uh, following the Quran, the, the ruling, following the ruling that extracted from the verse. This is following the Quran. Uh, another verse, Allah says, "فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا." No, by your Lord, they are not believers until the, till they make you their judge in the disputes that break out between them and find no resistance within themselves. And once you decide and submit themselves completely. Right? This is referring, going back to Allah's Messenger. All right? uh, during the time and even after, uh, any, disputes in, uh, any disputes have to go back to Allah and His Messenger. Right? So Allah is saying to the Prophet ﷺ, they are not really believers, they're not true believers, unless they make, make you their judge. Unless they make you their judge in their disputes. Another verse, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the messenger gives you, you should accept, and whatever he forbids you, you should forgo. Right? Establishing the authority of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to uh, make, uh, derive, uh, to, to legislate rulings. Right? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that men are not, are not allowed to wear gold. So this becomes now, it's haram for men to wear gold. And so on. All right, another verse, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ مِنْ خِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا When Allah and His Messenger have decided something, it is not for any believing man or woman to have a choice about it. All right, Allah says, hijab is obligatory. You have to wear the hijab. No one can come and say um, that I don't feel like doing it. Right? A person is weak and a man is a different story. Right? But a person, for a person to say that I don't believe, I, don't, I have to do this, when Allah and His Messenger have already declared that this has to be done, then this is going against the Qur'an, right? Because when Allah and His Messenger decide something, it is not for any believing man or woman to have a choice. You, we don't have a choice, right? Now if a person does not follow the commands due to weakness, due to anything else, all right, it will depend on uh, you know, their intentions or their beliefs regarding it, all right? But um, uh, if they deny something that is... Uh, the, 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 something is uh, a ruling is given in the Quran and Sunnah, it's clear, and deny it, then this could go to the level of kufr, right? It could go to the level of kufr. Somebody says, I don't believe in salah, all right? I don't believe in salah, and it's clearly there in the Quran that you have to pray, then this could rise to the level of disbelief, all right? Depending on the ruling or the nature of the ruling. Yes. Okay. So the question is, uh, if a person denies alcohol or denies smoking weed is uh, haram, 
is that the same or is it the same ruling? Generally speaking, uh, what will bring a person to disbelief is denying what is called ma'loom ad deen min al-durura. Denying what is known to the deen by necessity. These are things that every Muslim, regardless if you are a scholar or you are a layman, you must know. Right? So something like alcohol would fall under that. Every Muslim knows that, right? Pork, even the non-Muslims know that you can't eat pork. Right? Something like that, which is what they call ma'loom min al deen min al-durura. That this is known to the religion by necessity that you can't eat pork. Right? Known to the religion by necessity that you cannot drink alcohol. Even the non-Muslims know this, that you have to pray, that you have to give zakat. These are known to Islam, and known to the religion by necessity. If a person denies these things, then this is grounds for disbelief. Right? There might be certain exceptions. A person is a new Muslim. They just accepted Islam yesterday. They deny that nobody told me I have to pray, so I don't believe in prayer. But they just became Muslim yesterday, right? So they have an excuse. Nobody taught them, right? But a person who... Uh, has grown up in Islamic society and you have things that are known to the religion by necessity and they deny it, then this is all right, grounds for uh, rising to the level of disbelief. All right, from the Sunnah as well, we have. Uh, yeah. So alcohol, alcohol, yeah, alcohol. No, that's, not, that's, that's something that not everybody would know about, right? This is first, that's an, a modern issue to begin with, right? It didn't exist back then. So it would not fall under that, right? It would not fall under that. Uh, as for in the Sunnah, uh, Rasulullah says in Hadith, "Man, uh, man ata'ani faqad ata'a Allah. Whoever obeys me has obeyed Allah. Wa man asani faqad asa, faqad asa Allah. Whoever disobeys me has disobeyed Allah." And in the Hadith, he says, "Waladhi nafsi biyadi la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yakuna hawahu taba'an lima jitu bihi." None of you believe until. Uh, his desires follow that which I have brought. Right? And in the hadith, uh, take hold of my sunnah, alaykum bi sunnati. Right? All these are evidences that we have to follow the Quran and the sunnah and the rulings that are extracted from the Quran and the sunnah. Uh, another hadith, I have left you with that, uh, with that which, if you take hold it, of it, you will never go astray after me, the book of Allah and my sunnah. All right? So all of these are uh, evidences that we must follow the Quran and sunnah and the rulings that are extracted from the Quran and the Sunnah, those who op oppose the Quran and the Sunnah, there is a stern and severe warning. Look at the verse here. Those who oppose his command should be aware, should be aware or beware of a testing trial coming to them or a painful punishment striking them. All right, moving on, uh, we're going to go uh, to some fiqhi terms. All right, before we can study anything about fiqh, we have to have a basic understanding of some very important uh, fiqh terms. And these terms are going to come over and over again. All right? You're going to see these over and over again, so we must know uh, what they refer to. The first is al-fard. Al-fard. Right? Uh, these are words that we've heard all right, multiple times. All of us have heard these uh, terms before, or many of them. The fard is that, is that which the revealed law dema demands decisively in that the con consequence of doing it is reward and the consequence of leaving it is punishment. Right? This is fard, that uh, the lawgiver has demanded that you do this decisively. Right? Decisively. And there, the consequence of doing it is that you will be rewarded. Right? And the consequence of leaving it is that you may be punished. And this is what fard is. And example, fasting. All right, so fasting is farda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demanded us decisively to fast. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum siyam. All right, the consequence of doing it is that you are rewarded in the akhirah. Punishment, uh, the consequence of leaving it is that there is potential punishment if you do not fast. All right. Yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. Right, but the, yeah, so the shouldn't do, that's another category we're going to get to. Yeah, which would be haram, right? That would be under haram. So this is, this is only co covering what you have to do, what you're commanded to do, right? What you're commanded to stay away from, that will be haram, it's going to come later. All right, so what you're commanded to do, this is fard, such as fasting, such as salah, 
and Hajj and all any other other pillars of Islam and anything else that is uh, we're obligated to do. All right, so uh, fasting, you're obligated to fast. If you fast, there is reward. If you do not fast, intentionally do not fast without excuse, then there is potential punishment. And all this is referring to in the next life. In the next life. All right, we have something else called wajib. All right, is there a difference between farud and wajib? All right, so the, the other three schools of Islamic law, the, the Malikis, the Shafi'is, and the Hanbalis, they do not distinguish between these two. Farud and wajib is the same exact thing, except in one chapter of fiqh, which is hajj. We'll talk about that later. All right, but for the Han, Hanbalis, the Shafi'is, and the Malikis, there's no difference between farud and wajib. They're the same thing. All right, the Hanafis, they distinguish between farud and wajib. So for the Hanafis, farud is uh, something that we're obligated to do based on explicit proof. Explicit proof. All right? Such as salah or fasting. All right? The proof that you have to fast is explicit in the Quran. Kutiba alaykum as uh, The proof that you have to pray is explicit in the Quran and Sunnah. Wa aqimu salah. Right? Inna Allah kataba khamsa salawat. Right? Uh, and uh, So there's explicit proof that you have to pray. So this will be farad. Now there are some other things that uh, the proof is not as explicit. It's not explicit. It's ob uh, they would consider an obligation, but because the proof is not explicit, it doesn't go to the level of farad but it goes to a level right below which is wajib, right? Uh, and they would say, for example, we gave the example witr. Witr, witr is what in the Hanafi school? Wajib, it's not fard, right? It's not fard, it's wajib, because the, explicit, the proof is not explicit for witr. But there are proofs that witr is wajib, according to the Hanafis. For example, you have the hadith where Rasulullah says, man lam yutir falaysa minna. Whoever does not make witr, he's not from amongst us, right? Is that clear that this is wajib? It could be argued, right? But it is not, it's not like the clarity of uh, the salah that you have to pray. Right? Or another hadith, إِنَّ Allah has zada, zadakum salatan وَهِيَ الْوِتْرُ That Allah has added for you a salah, and it is the witr. So pray between the, the Isha and the, and the, uh, the Fajr. Right? Is this clear that it is wajib or it's mandatory? Right? It can be implied from that, right? but it, isn't, it doesn't rise to the level of explicit proof. So they would consider this wajib, but it's not the level of fard, right? And only the Hanafis do this. The other three schools, they do not distinguish between whether the proof is explicit or implicit. As long as we can derive that something is obligatory, then we, we, whether we call it fard or the wajib is the same thing, right? Which is that uh, there, the consequence is reward in the hereafter and punishment uh, in the hereafter if you leave it off without excuse. All right, with the exception of Hajj, right? With the exception of Hajj, uh, for the other three schools, uh, in Hajj we do differentiate between farud and wajib, right? In Hajj specifically, why? Because there are certain actions in Hajj. If you do it, you have no Hajj. If you do it, you don't. If you don't do it, sorry. If you don't do it, you have no Hajj, right? Such as standing in Arafah, al wukuf bi Arafah. If you don't go, if you don't stand in Arafah, you have no Hajj. You have no Hajj, right? So this will be considered fard, because if you leave it off, your hajj is, you have no hajj. And there are certain actions that you have to do it, but if you leave it off, you can make up for it by offering a sacrifice. Right? For example, stoning the jamarat. Somebody, they woke up late, all right, and they didn't get to stone the jamarat. They missed. Uh, is their hajj still valid? All right? they, their hajj is still valid, but they have to do something to make up for it. They have to... Uh, they have to do a slaughter, right? Alayhi dam, they say, right? They have to offer a sacrifice. Once they offer that sacrifice, then they have maintained the validity of that hajj, right? So this will be considered wajib, right? But not fard. But this is only in the chapter of hajj that we would, we would differentiate between uh, fard and wajib. All right? Other than that, they are essentially the same thing. According to the three other schools, according to the Hanafis, they distinguish between fard and wajib, and we gave the uh, the reasoning for that. All right, uh, so <clears throat> that's uh, moving on to number three, al-fard al-aini, individual obligation. 
All right, so this is a demand on every individual Muslim, such as the prayer, fasting, hajj, if you're able to do so. This is, uh, this is mandatory in every legally responsible Muslim. All right, and it is not sufficient if only some of them carry it out. Every Muslim must carry these out. All right, and these are well known, the salah, the fasting, and other pillars of Islam. All right, uh, opposite of that would be al-fard al-kifai, collective obligation. So this is something that is demanded to, for the Muslims to perform collectively, meaning that if some perform it, the obligation is lifted on the rest. If some perform it, the obligation is lifted on the rest. For example, Salat al-Janazah. Muslim dies, it is the communal obligation that somebody must pray on that Muslim who has passed away. Uh, if one person prays that janazah, then the obligation is lifted on the rest of the Muslims. If nobody prays the janazah, and the people had the opportunity to pray it, it's not like they didn't know, they knew, and nobody prayed the janazah, then the entire community is sinful. All right, so that's an example. Uh, also, uh, in that same chapter, the, the, the janazah, the shrouding, right? somebody has to shroud the dead. Right? Somebody has to do that from the community. This is a communal obligation, right? Washing the body. Somebody has to do that. If nobody does it, then the entire community is sinful. Right? This is called al farul al-kifai. Anybody have any other examples? Hmm? Good. Ex excellent, very good. Somebody walks into the majlis, they give salam. All right? As long as one person responds, then this is sufficient for everyone. Nobody responds, everybody is sinful. Right, so somebody comes in the masjid and they say, Assalamu alaikum. It is only uh, mandatory for one person to respond. Of course, everybody else can respond, but it is not, it is not an individual obligation for everybody to respond. Right, one person responds, and it, that suffices the entire group. Nobody responds, everybody is sinful. Anybody have any other examples? Good. Being a scholar, right? going, to, going and studying. Or commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Right? Allah says, and let there be a nation from amongst you who uh, they perform good and they, uh, they, uh, they command the good and they forbid the evil. All right, so this is communal obligation. Some people have to do it. If, it, no, if there's a, an evil going on and nobody says anything about it, then the entire community is sinful. All right, but if a few people go and they... they uh, say something about it, then they have lifted the obligation on the rest of the Muslims. All right, seeking knowledge as well as you mentioned. Yeah. Can I Go ahead. Uh, what's the difference between so like a three and four subcategories of one? Three and four? Yeah. Yeah. So this was subcategory far. Subcategories of far. So far is branched into far aini and far kifai. And as we said, they are it's essentially the same thing as wajib. Right, according to the other three schools. All right, uh, number five, a rukun. A rukun. A rukun is uh, we can translate as pillar, and this is something that is obligatory for you to do, and it is part of the actual action. So, for example, in salah, reciting al-fatiha, this is a rukun. It is obligatory to do. You have to recite al-fatiha, and it is part of the salah. Right, it is actually part of the salah, or bowing the rukur or prostration in the sujood. These are called arkan. Rukun is the singular. Arkan is the plural. These are things that we have to do, and they are part of the action. All right, number six is similar. And the difference between number five and number six, number six is a shart, a shart. This is something that we have to do. It's obligatory to do, but it is not part of the actual action, meaning it comes before the action. So for example, wudu is wudu part of salah. Right? It's not part of the salah. Right? You, there's wudu and there's salah. So wudu is a shart. It is a condition for the salah. So it must precede the salah, but it is not actually part of the salah. But you still have to do it. You cannot, you cannot have salah without wudu. So wudu is a call, it's called a shart. It's a condition. All right? uh, another example is the qibla. So facing the qibla, this is not actually part of the salah. All right? This is not like reciting al-fatiha and going to rukur and going to sujood. Right? Those are arkan, those are pillars of the salah. Facing the qibla is a shart, is a condition. Right? It must be present before you pray. So you cannot start praying and then midway through the prayer, then you face the qibla. It must be 
present before you start the prayer. That you must be facing the Qibla and start the prayer facing the Qibla. Alright, so these are called Shurut. Shurut is the plural. Shart is the singular. So these are actions they are obligatory to do, but they're not actually part of the action. They're not actually part of the action. Such as wudu, such as facing the Qibla, all right, such as having clean clothes. All right, clothes that is free from impurities. So when you pray, your clothes must be free from impurities, from urine and feces and anything else of that nature. All right, this is a condition. It's not part of the salah. All right, it's, not, it's not actually part of the salah. It's a precondition right, for the salah. These are called shurud. Mm -hmm. Um, they might have some details for that. So the brother's asking about uh, in the Hanafi school is the same thing. They might have. Uh, well, these examples. Yeah, these examples. Yes, yeah. These examples are specifically for the Shafi'i school. Um, the, the Hanafi school might have some more uh, details. Yeah. No, he's talking about the Fatiha for people who are not able to recite it. Right. Anyway, so maybe we could research that issue yeah. and and, and uh, yeah. All right. So pillar a rukun short condition. All right. Uh, al mandub recommended. All right. So mandub is this is something that we are demanded or asked to do, but it is not a decisive demand. In the sense that there's the consequences of doing it is reward, but there's no punishment if you leave it. Yes. Yeah, they're synonyms. All right, so the brother's asking what is the difference between mandub and mustahab? They're synonyms, they're the same thing. Yeah. So you have mandub, you have sunnah, tatawwa', nafil, all are synonyms. There are some scholars who make differentiation, but in general, they are the same. They're all the same. And they all refer to what we are asked to do. And if you do it, you're rewarded. But if you do not do it, there is no punishment. There's no consequence of punishment. Yeah. OK. OK. So the question is, why are the three schools agreeing and the Hanafis are differing? This, this goes back to uh, the way the, the, the Islamic legal theory, the way they derive Islamic legislation. There is, there's a, they have a different method of, of doing it, keep, to keep it simple. There's a different method of how they, uh, how they most of it is the same actually, right? Uh, it, may, it might seem that they're drastically different, but a lot of it is the same. Uh, but the, the, this goes back to uh, the some differences in Islamic legal theory, what we call usul al fiqh. Yeah. N not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, no. no um, that seems a bit strange. Yeah. But that's a discussion for another uh, another day, inshallah. All right. So we have al mandub, which is if you do it, then this is. Reward. There's reward if you do so. If you do not do it, then there's no consequence if you leave it. And there are many examples. The mid-morning prayer, duha, salat duha. If you perform salat duha, you're rewarded. If you don't do it, there's no punishment. Praying at night, qiyam al-layl. Fasting the six days of shawwal. And many other examples of things that if you do it, you're rewarded. If you do not do it, there is no sin. There's no threat of punishment. And as we said, there are synonyms to this. Sunnah, Mustahab, Tatawwa, Nafal. These are all synonyms. Um, but the preferred term are the, is Mandub or Mustahab. Right? The, word, the, the word Sunnah, uh, it can cause confusion. So it's best to avoid using this term uh, because this, the word Sunnah has multiple meanings depending on which field of Islamic uh, science you are referring to. So for the scholars of Fiqh, Sunnah means Mandub, meaning something that if you do, you're rewarded. And if you don't do it, there's no punishment. Right? But for the scholars of hadith, sunnah means anything that has been related 
from the Prophet ﷺ, from his speech, from his actions, from his approvals, from his descriptions, from his seerah. Right? The, uh, the hadith scholars, they, when they say sunnah, they have a different meaning. Right? The scholars of Islamic legal theory, uh, they consider uh, sunnah to mean what, has, what we can derive the law from. So this would be speech, and we gave this definition earlier, right? The speech, actions, approvals. This is sunnah according to the scholars of Islamic legal theory, which we call usul al-fiqh. All right, so the word sunnah, according to scholars of Islamic theology, when they say sunnah, they mean opposite of bid'ah. Right, so when they say ahl sunnah they mean not ahl bid'ah. All right, so the word sunnah has different usages. So for that reason, uh, we use terms like this, mandub or mustahab, uh, so that we don't get into any confusion. Right? But it essentially refers to what we are asked to do, and you're rewarded for doing it, but you're not punished if you leave it off. Um, how much time do you have left? All right, I think we can end here. We have a few more terms. We'll leave those for next session, inshallah. Um, and we'll, we'll pause here for any questions, as well as uh, going, getting some um, refreshments, inshallah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the brother, you're asking about the term sunnah mu'akkadah. That's also in other schools as well. Yeah. Uh, that's also in other schools. Uh, that just means whether a sunnah is emphasized, meaning the Prophet never left it, or he left it sometimes. Um, I don't think they have it here, but it is there. It is there. Uh, further study. But it's not mentioned here. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the question is, things that are permissible, all right, and the person is leaving it off, thinking they're going to get rewarded? Or doing something. Mm -hmm. Doing something with maybe a certain intention. Okay, so th th there's two discussions to that. There's the, first, the first discussion is doing something permissible, but with an intention uh, to make it something uh, from the religion or something to aid you in the religion, all right? Um, such as... A person uh, <clears throat> going to sleep early so that they can wake up for Qiyam al-Layl. Right? So going to sleep early, the original ruling is this, of this is what? Permissible. Right? The original ruling is permissible. You can go to sleep early or you can you know, go to sleep a little bit later. But if a person has the intention, I'm going to go to sleep early so I can wake up for Qiyam al-Layl, then this, will, this intention will change that mubah to... Uh, recommended. Right? And the scholars say, بِالنِّيَةِ تَتَحَوَّلْ الْعَادَاتِ إِلَى الْعِبَادَاتِ That with the intention, the adat, the normal things, they, they, they can turn into ibadat. Right? Or if a person going, going to work because they want to provide for their family, because they know that uh, they are uh, obligated to provide for their family. So they go with this intention. So now that thing that is permissible, it, it becomes an act of worship. Right? So, that's one discussion. And then the other discussion is a person leaving off something permissible, which was talking about the vegans, right? So you're leaving off something permissible for, for what reason? I mean, that's um, a, complicated, a complicated discussion, but um, if a person tries to make unlawful what is lawful, then this is uh, not allowed, right? And th there's hadith on this. Uh, a man came to Rasulullah and he asked him, you know, if I do, if I pray the salah, if I do this, wa ahlaltul halam, wa haramtul haram, right? I, I make sure I, I, I make sure that uh, the, the halal is halal, right? I acknowledge what is halal is halal, I acknowledge what is haram is haram. Uh, if, if I do all these things, I will I enter jannah? And the scholars have mentioned that uh, by ahlaltul halal, meaning that. I don't make what is halal haram, right? Or I don't make what is haram halal. So if a person does something like this where 
something is halal and they make it haram, right? Then this is this would be uh, not this is this this would not be allowed. I, but if a person does that for like health reasons, so they say, I'm not going to eat meat, but this has nothing to do with religion because I just want to be healthy. But they're not making it haram, right? They're not saying that this meat is haram, but they're doing it for health reasons. Then you know that's that's a bit different. Allahu Akbar. Alright, uh, we'll pause here inshallah because we have some refreshments and we have to uh, give the adhan soon. So we'll resume next week inshallah. This, uh, I don't know if there's any questions from the sisters. Um, was there a texting or anything like that? The number? Okay. Okay. Uh, if there's any questions from the sisters, maybe you could write it down and send it up. And if we don't answer it now, we can answer it uh, next week. Okay, no questions. Okay. So we'll, we'll pause here. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.